welcome. Thanks, thanks for uh, having a look at uh, what I'm gonna gonna show. It's uh, uh, two add-ons uh, for Blender BIM. Um, I thought it. Uh, I heard uh, quite a few times about um, Blender BIM that um, uh, it's it's a super interesting Hello? project. But well, is it is it? Uh, okay, I, I'm gonna switch to. The presentation. But, um, so I, often, often I heard people talking about Blender BIM and how how interesting it is. But then they were were often saying something like, ah, but is it is it already is it really ready yet? Um, uh, can can we use it? And I, and I really don't like this um, general questions because it it very much depends on what you're doing with it, right? Uh, whether it's ready for your task or not. So that is why I'm especially happy that I can show two things where it was ready for us. Uh, company I'm working at, and um, maybe that helps or inspire to for others to to build your own Blender BIM um, uh, add-ons as well. Um, maybe quickly to me, I'm uh, Frederick. I'm, I was working for Herzog Demmerhorn Manager for the last uh, about eight years before I switched to Erne Holzbau. Um, so I, I transitioned kind of from this um, BIM manager architecture view to um, uh, to Anna, which is a production company, but also has the planning and um, like uh, architects and engineers and production in house and uh, fancy robots and um, big um, milling machines and uh. right. So um, so I kind of transitioned from this um, kind of uh, architecture perspective into this uh, like uh, more uh, different uh, disciplines involved um, view. And that was um, not only very interesting, but also will, will show up in the in the add-ons, I guess. So the first one I'm going to show is uh, IFC Void Data. It's a add-on that basically aggregates data on um, provision for voids or openings in walls, ceilings, um, uh, slabs um, that you have in your buildings. And um, we had a very specific task there, which I'm going to present. And then another one that's uh, Rhino to BB to uh, Revit. That is basically a kind of a, a bridge uh, from getting Rhino, very specific Rhino models um, uh, that we created with a generator uh, into Revit the way we wanted to use them, um, which was yeah, maybe not as easy as it sounds at first glance. All right, I start with the IFC void data. Um, um, yeah, we'll quickly uh, talk about the task and then uh, a couple of uh, proof of concepts I built to see how this could, could be done and then show what I why, why I loved um, uh, working with Blender BIM in this um, interactive um, REPL, in the Python REPL, and then show the, the Blender BIM in, BIM in action. Um, so the task was basically to aggregate um, data for provision for voids, so like all these openings that you have in, in walls or slabs. Um, and there were, a, a, this was the initial, initial sketch of um, my boss, and he was asking me, like, ah, can we, can we have all this data, like the dimensions? Okay, easy, that, that's data that's right on the object. Then the geometry, uh, they also ha had that on their objects. Then the material of um, uh, that, that was, um, of the, of the wall, but also the material of the pipes and what is in the pipes that, that are going through and what kind of fire rating do the walls have. And that all would lead to the um, information to what are the fire protection seals that we uh, would need to uh, uh, put into our tender. So that was kind of the, the goal of this um, uh, data aggregation. Um, so as probably anybody would do it, uh, I started with the tool I'm, uh, I was most familiar with. This was uh, uh, in, in Revit. I uh, did a little um, proof of concept, um, checking if I can have indeed all these intersections of these um, voids and pipes and ducts. Um, then I thought like, hmm, okay, um, there's some, some downsides to Revit, like the IFC, there were, there were huge um, IFC files. And um, IFC files going into Revit are um, neither fast nor always great um, in terms of what the results are. Um, so I thought like, okay, what else do we have? Then I saw like, ah, FreeCAD and they have a super awesome um, uh, a Python REPL there too. This is, this is very fascinating because I can even click on the GUI buttons and then get the Python code from, uh, for it. This was like, 
I, I never learned so fast uh, how how the how the API worked. Um, but but by that time, um, Freecut did not had not unlocked unlocked yet the um, multi processing. Uh, IFC import, so it was unfortunately similarly slow by then, um, uh, like like Revit. But it was uh, yeah, it was also doable there. I found out, and then um, I, I tried it out in, in Blender whether like the functionality would work. And um, I just show you quickly the components that I needed there. Um, so I'm gonna switch back and forth to a little live demo, but I will only show the, the proof of concept for, for Blender BIM now. So um, what I really like is the, is the uh, Python uh, repo that we have in Blender BIM. Uh, since I'm programming in, in Python for some years, uh, having this interactive thing that works for me like a chatbot, it feels like uh, I can I can talk to the database kind of. So the first thing I wanted to know is can I can I actually get data from the elements? And um, so, this I could just um, try out. Um, I, I, would, I would go to somewhere into that model, and then I would say, um, uh, "Okay, yeah, here are my active objects." Um, so this is the element proxy provision for void one and eight that I have selected here as well. And then I could just um, very conveniently. Um, tab into what are the um, data points that I could, could get a hold of. So here, for example, I just check, okay, what, what is that attribute? Oh, the global ID, that's that's definitely useful. And what is in there, I can get to read the string. So this is a very simple example, but you, as you know, it works the same uh, or very similar um, with the PSET. A little disclaimer, um, this is an older um, Blender BIM version, so it's not working like this anymore. But uh, the, the add-ons are for very specific um, Blender BIM versions that I also um, uh, sh show in their respective um, uh, repositories. Okay, so this was the first step I needed to know whether I can get a hold of data of objects. Then the next thing was I needed to know, can I do clash detection? So um, usually, when I was working with voids, and I worked a, a couple of years um, mostly on, on uh, void info and uh, void synchronization between architects and um, uh, engineers uh, at HDM, um, I will show a link to a repo there later uh, regarding that as well. Um, the, there, there's usually like two ways how you can check for intersections. Uh, one is the bounding box, so you can just check whether bounding boxes of elements intersect, or you can check whether the geometry intersects. But of course, um, bounding box intersection only works if, if your things are really boxes or very box-like. Um, but as soon as they're like like an L-shaped room, a C-shaped room, that that wouldn't work for bounding box at all anymore. So the, the bounding box I could easily do, I knew, but could it also do clash detection like on the geometry level? And so here it would be the triangles of the meshes. And uh, the answer was yes as well. So there's a GUI, but of course I just went to the um, to the, the underlying functionality. So if you're going to the um, the uh, what's it called? The scene properties of Blender BIM, um, then you can say, okay, well, I have two clash sets, a clash set A, a clash set B, and then I just ask whether they are uh, actually colliding or not. So I say, okay, this, this void is clash set A, this pipe here is uh, clash set B, and um, can then say, I want, uh, execute, want to execute a, a Blender clash, and then in the system console, I can see, oh, they are actually colliding. So I get a listing for each triangle. Um, so so that part also worked. So that was that was great to know. So I, I could get data from the elements. I could check whether they're intersecting. Um, now the third, third part missing was, could I write something back onto these elements? Uh, when I found out that they're uh, intersecting, I would, I would query the data and write it back onto the, um, uh, onto the void element. So when I look at the P sets, um, we got uh, some data in there already, and uh, some that then our, um, uh, our add-on would provide. But right now we're just checking, can we actually write um, 
um, to to the element uh, data back. So I would say, okay, and zero. Um, ah, I, I have a um, a little uh, convenience um, functionality for that. So uh, from I see void data dot utils, which is nice. You can from your add-ons. Um, uh, we can import functionality then later on, which is very handy. Um, we want to add a custom piece at key values and um, add custom piece at key value. So we are looking at this um, uh, current object. Uh, we want to write to the, um, let's say, to this property set model. And then let's say the key is uh, OS Arch. Um, and then we say meetup, and then say we want to do that, and you will see. Okay, indeed, our our um, data just shows up. So that was basically the three pieces I needed to be able to say, okay, I can now go to different models and check um, which pipes are going um, or ducts are going through this through these voids. Query all their data collected. And write it back to the to the void, and um, I'm going to show now in the um, uh, in the add-on itself how how that would work. So I'm going to create a blank scene and uh, just start the add-on. So this is you see this is just a, uh, a regular um, uh, Blender add-on. Um, the idea is basically you always have a, a, um, a void model, and then all the other models are optional, just depending on what you want, what kind of clash information you, you basically want. So here we have a, a void model, a architecture model, and then different engineering models. Uh, sorry for the German-speaking abbreviation, so that would be Branschus, so um, fire rating model. This is a special thing I'm going to uh, talk uh, once we see the model. And then electricity, heating, uh, ventilation, and so on. But of course, I don't like clicking on all these buttons myself, um, so I said, okay, I, I can also point it directly to a, um, to a directory, and then it will scan the directory and find whether there are models already, and uh, yes, I, I prepared some there. And then the only other functionality I need right now is uh, run the void data aggregation. So what it will do with this is um, to basically first get the voids into, uh, into a model. And that's that's already the whole thing. You, you find this one was going really fast because it's um, it's working with, with a cached version, but also it's it's a very small cube, right? So we have only 200 voids, so there's a there's not a ton of uh, information um, and a ton of objects in this um, uh, model. But um, for the whole size project, um, there were about 2,800 voids, um, and there it took a few hours, of course, um, to get all the geometry um, calculated. Um, so what it was doing, it was basically yeah, loading loading the void. Uh, so these are all the black boxes. Um, then loading the architecture model. These are these walls. And then uh, loading a um, BR model. This is the fire rating model. This is something I proposed um, since the object uh, since, since the project um, there was uh, unfortunately the architecture model was lacking the uh, fire rating in the walls where I would have liked them. But um, I proposed we could have a fire rating uh, model instead, whereas basically you look at these um, simple solid, uh, simple surfaces and they just carry the information, what kind of fire rating they are, so EI30. Uh, and then you say, okay, whenever you have a void that is uh, colliding with that, then you get um, the EI30 in there. And um, the idea is basically the void is um, checking with the clutch detection uh, what is running through and then collects all the information. So this one here says, okay, I'm, um, I'm, I'm colliding with uh, BR, with fire rating and with heating. And these are my heating um, um, uh, pipes. And then I put just for demo purposes, put in a, a, a material there. 
a, a, um, a pipe material, a pipe dimension, then the um, colliding IFCs, um, and then if there's a fire rating, we would write that here. But of course, um, there's not only the model view, which is interesting by itself, where you can check a lot of things, and um, also the outliner would be um, would be according to the model, so I can could could hide uh, or show uh, these these um, models or, or isolate them. So if I don't want to see, for example, um, ventilation, or I just want to isolate it or hide it, I can I can quickly do that and then maybe uh, find out specific things about the model. But the um, model view is one view. Another view that um, the that was uh, already in the uh, one of the first goals of the tools was only to say, also to say okay we want to have a, a spreadsheet view of this and um, so you can open the um, the result and then have uh, yeah, all the data that, that we have here in, in your um, uh, your spreadsheet um, application so there are only two hundred and um, but in the, in the full model, there were like um, about almost 3,000. And what we were looking at was basically like very simple data, like uh, just the IFC description name, which level they're in, the dimensions, um, the, their, their uh, future uh, um, fire seal ID, um, then with which disciplines it would intersect, um, with which, which um, IFCs, and then um, the fire rating, of course, the uh, wall names or wall materials, because you see they were not like they were not always um, full information on, on this model. And then if we had room intersections, um, uh, let me go here. Um, I only have a few rooms in this model, so that's why we have so few. Uh, then it would tell, okay, I am a void between the room name 0081 and 0083 and with these GIDs. So you would get a, a uh, um, overview of your void data. And as with any um, uh, spreadsheet, uh, you could make just a filterable table, um, which yeah, uh, was then helpful to uh, determine which of these voids would uh, need a specific seal because due to the fire regulations in Switzerland, certain pipes with certain medium and with certain um, uh, uh, wall materials need certain, um, uh, yeah, certain special fire seals. And uh, with these, uh, with these uh, collected information, we could um, just uh, find out um, without going through floor plans um, what what we would uh, need to put into tender. So that is the um, first one. And um, the other add-on uh, was very different. Um, and uh, I really liked this um, kind of... Uh, this, these different goals of these uh, tools we built here. Um, there we wanted to have a uh, generated Rhino model that we would want to use in Revit, basically. And um, this, like at first glance, this kind of sounds trivial, but um, you will hopefully see that, that yeah, there's uh, some, some uh, this is kind of a bumpy road, um, depending on what you, what you want uh, from it. Um, and this is uh, where I'm gonna explain what the difference would be of a uh, model in place uh, direct shape uh, in comparison to native Revit objects and that we actually wanted, um, at least for some parts, and then show the Blender bin or add on uh, at the end. So we had a Rhino model. I, uh, my fantastic uh, colleague, Edita, uh, she wrote this tool here that can basically uh, generate um, uh, plans and also the 3D model. And um, we can use it then to very quickly fabricate uh, at our facilities, um, yeah, these these simple modules. This is of course not a. Uh, this is this has very yeah specific um, restrictions on the plugin, um, but uh, for um, quick and simple 
um, modularized um, wood construction um, uh, buildings like this here, um, this is a, is a very nice and quick tool to, to build these. But then the idea was to not only move this um, model from Rhino to Catwork, which is, which is the um, software they're using at Anna for um, the wood construction engineering and um, to deliver the, the plants to the milling machine uh, to, to, uh, at our, at our um, facilities. Um, but we also wanted to, for some project, uh, want to continue to work uh, with them in Revit. And then the question was, okay, how, how will we get it there? And um, we would, of course, like to not only get the elements somehow there, uh, we also wanted the data. And for the elements, we found out that just getting some elements is maybe not even that useful. So these are the paths I, I, paths I found <laughs> um, in our context. So the first thing I tried was, okay, we have the Rhino model and in Rivet you can uh, basically just uh, import or link um, a, a, a Rhino model. And um, well, you get a geometric representation, but uh, if you want to keep on working with that model, uh, it's kind of useless because it's like one big chunk of something and there has there's no um, elements of certain categories. There's no level hosting or anything. Um, so that didn't work really for us. Um, so I checked the next thing. Um, I, I not really checked, but I, I considered it at least. So there's this Rhino Insight um, thing where you can uh, have another uh, application in the, si in the same um, uh, memory address space can kind of, and then have them communicate. So you could reproduce your elements from Rhino inside Revit with the Revit API, but then you have to write it in Revit API. And then I looked at paths where we would go through Cardwork, because Cardwork, we were going there anyways with the model. But then when I was in Cardwork, I um, exported IFC from there, and the IFC that ended up in Revit there was, uh, yeah, also not ideal. I show why in a second. And then because they were not ideal, I could I saw, thought like, okay, if I have this non-ideal IFC due to the way of how Revit uh, interprets these IFCs, I could patch them up with Blender BIM and this this, this worked fine. This was uh, quite some reverse engineering and uh, Dion quite helped a, a bit there to get like some of the elements um, to, to elements that would work for us in Revit, so I could um, go now over four applications, which is which is quite quite a lot, and we didn't like it for that reason, of course. Uh, so we would go from Rhino to uh, Catwork to Blender BIM to Revit. Um, so that was a lot of um, applications. So I thought, like, okay, why why do we need Catwork in that chain at all? We could go from Rhino and maybe open the Rhino model from from Blender BIM. So there's a, a Rhino uh, um, file importer for Blender BIM. I even found two, but one was working really well. And from there, I patched them the IFC Rivet. So here are the quick um, pros and cons again. Uh, so directly from from 3DM to Revit, um, the objects are not really usable. Rhino Insight would be nice and fairly direct, but you have to create all the things again in Revit API, which is yeah, quite some work. Um, then we have the, ch the chain over uh, over CAD work um, with many applications to process. And then um, the final path we chose um, was yeah, still fairly direct. And we were then able to kind of manipulate the IFC how we needed it. And that was that was really nice. Um, Blenderbin was very versatile there to that we could yeah massage the IFC in a way that um, Revit would do things that it wouldn't do with other uh, um, IFC inputs, like uh, especially looking at uh, walls and um, uh, floors. Um, yeah, and then we would, out of the deal, we also would get an IFC, which might be um, uh, useful in other places too. Um, so a thing which I'm going to show later in the model also is, um, so what you usually would get uh, if you just have 
some wall um, non-patched by um, uh, Blender BIM, you would get this model in place um, direct shape. So you see there's no notion of where this, where this wall belongs to, to which level. It's just somewhere in space. Okay, it has the right category, but um, yeah, you don't know which, which uh, level it belongs to. And um, what we wanted was a basic wall with some type. We can remap these later, but please be a real wall, which we can stretch and uh, have room bounding and uh, have the data uh, mapped directly onto the instance. And uh, that was the thing we were aiming for with, here with the example of a wall. Um, so we want to have like the typed elements. We want to have the, the typical modeling. Uh, we want to have these elements level hosted, so also all, all, that all our scheduling would work. Uh, and we would want to have these walls to be able to host windows and windows, which wouldn't happen with these ones. Um, yeah, so the, the MIPDS is my, my own uh, <laughs> creation there of just saying, okay, this is a model, model in place direct shape. And um, yeah, let me let me quickly show this. Um, gonna go to Blender Burn. So this is a very simple add-on. Um, it was also very quick to do it in terms of the UI because I had made the IFC void data before, so I could use this as a template. So the same idea goes: uh, if you're gonna make your own um, Blender add-on, feel free to to grab the grab my uh, um, repos and uh, build your, your own add-on on top and they're, they're uh, open source and um, uh, GPL license. So you're free to grab them. Um, all I can really do in this thing is A, get a, get a model. Um, so this is one of the exported um, uh, models. And then I say, okay, um, let, well, let's, let's create an IFC model and, and patch it that it works for us in Revit. And um, then it, uh, once it's ready, um, we, we're gonna have a, uh, so now it's ready. So it said like, okay, this is all cool. Here's your IFC output. And uh, yeah, here it also says that. We can already have a quick look here. You see, this is really the same, very simple uh, box models. It's really just like, like bounding boxes of everything, um, but with the right, um, Classification, so we get an IFC window here, and we got all the data that we got uh, from our um, uh, plugin, also from or from our add-on uh, from Rhino. We just mapped them over onto onto pieces, and uh, now I have this um, have this IFC saved, and I can go uh, into Revit. Let me actually close this. And we just opened the IFC. So models, and this should be today's date. Yep. And this shouldn't take too long. Yes. Um, so the idea is now quickly move this over and have this in a nice representative way. Um, the idea is now, of course, we have uh, some of the stuff is already very nice. So we get uh, typed uh, floors, we get typed um, walls, um, but you see all these um, uh, window and door elements, these are just like these boxes, but um, we would actually like to work with this model in, in Revit and uh, maybe also have um, have some rooms in the floor plans because right now there's there's really not not much going on. Um, so on the Revit side, um, we were um, then having another uh, script that would say, where did I put it? Model probably, yeah. Um, okay, I take all this data that we patched in, in Blender BIM, and then now with all the data that is in these elements, I can create the needed window types, door types, um, join the floors, join the walls, and have a, uh, a flip the windows into correct positions, and uh, yeah, have a finally a, a, a usable um, or a, a model that, that works for us. And um, 
this was kind of the the, the bridge that we that we uh, had in mind there. Of course, this is not perfect. Um, this again also is a is um, tied to a specific um, Blender BIM version, unfortunately, because um, Blender BIM was moving so fast, and I had some other projects that were also worked on, so I wasn't able yet to update them to the newest um, Blender BIM logic. But um, you can find these repos um, under these links here. Um, gotta quickly go over there, and there's also. Uh, listed which kind of um, uh, Blender BIM version you would you would need for uh, for each of these um, add-ons. Um, then maybe if you're interested in the topic of um, uh, voids uh, in, inside of Revit, there's another um, repo I link to, uh, which is about um, voids. This is specifically to Revit, but it's maybe also interesting if you're if you're into uh, how to handle um, uh, yeah, um, provisions for voids or voids in your in your um, uh, project um, and keep the voids synced with with Revit and the engineering model. This might be interesting. And then also, what kind of um, interesting benefits you can get when once you have basically a a scripted infrastructure on voids that you can actually. Um, Kind of scripted um, dimension them and scripted tag them. If you have very repetitive um, uh, tasks like like these, like many many um, RCPs, for example, that you all want to get tagged and, um, and dimensioned, and then maybe also interesting. This was a, a prototype I did at um, uh, HTM where we were basically checking a rule set with these voids. Um, okay, uh, what are voids that are kind of not not um, uh, not working with our rules, saying they're too close to the floor, too close to the bottom, uh, to the to the ceiling. Um, they're too wide for this chip uh, or uh, uh, chip wall uh, stands, or they're in the um, door um, projection line. Um, so there's there's some other maybe interesting um, uh, open source uh, information regarding voids as well. Yeah, and this is this is kind of what I have to share. And I thought maybe there's a there's a little Q and A if if anyone is interested. Yeah, who's got some questions? Thanks for that presentation. That's really good. Nice to see some very um, very specific use cases being taken all the way to production which is what this uh, presentation was all about. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I've always got some questions ready, but who else has got a question? I was thinking you showed, um, just for people who use Revit, uh, I saw that you have um, PyRevit installed. And just for anyone right. who for anyone who doesn't know Pi Rivet, if you use Rivet, then you need Pi Rivet, which is I, um, I absolutely agree. And maybe if you want to try out, um, there's there's um, multiple ways how you can do it. Uh, you can of course go via the official installer, which is probably the nicest way if you can get that to work with your IT department or in your company that you can install yourself because you need admin. Um, uh, privileges for that. If you don't have that, um, let me actually quickly screen share in the same in the same um, repository where also the um, white data and everything is. Um, there's also a, a custom PyRevit clone that we use for Anna Holzbau, and there's an installer which works completely without any admin installer. Of course, you have the, the downside, quote unquote, the downside that that this is. Like our custom bundled um, PyRevit, um, so you get the official PyRevit part, and you also get that little um, the little extra tools that that we have. You can use them or not; that doesn't matter. Um, but the advantage here is anyone can click on that, and in the in a regular um, uh, Py, uh, uh, in a regular Revit install, this PyRevit will install without admin. Uh, Privileges. I just wanted to, to to tell that there's this alternative path. 
yeah. So for anyone who um, is interested in doing some Python scripting to uh, add functions to Revit, that's absolutely the way to go there. Um, he's doing, they're doing a lot of great work on that. Yeah, maybe I can quickly also say one or two words about it. Um, yeah. So they, uh, since I was working in PyRevit and Revit Python shell for quite some years, and uh, yeah, this is this is uh, I, I really love interactive rebels, but um, I also like this kind of um, the two um, tools that were enabling uh, doing all these little um, uh, scripts. So uh, the way I would work usually is um, I would work via into uh, the, the um, Revit Python shell. So whenever I have questions about, like, say, an element, uh, I would go and say, OK, I want to know what this thing can do. So here's my uh, object. And then I can uh, maybe ask for the ID or um, uh, look up some parameters um, with autocomplete usually. yeah. Look at parameter and let's say what is the mark um, dot as string and um, you can you can work with a single element and then start writing your little logic and then once you have a little bit more of code um, you can put it you can basically save it as a py file into the right directory and then it becomes a button which is um, very handy and once it's a button um, you can click them and run these uh, scripts, um, but you can also, so for example, I have this script to get when you have a line-like object um, and you want to just know the, the coordinates, it's a super simple script, but uh, it's very nice to see if you have any de deviation, if this is a like slightly tilted wall. Um, you can either click on it and the script runs, or you can alt click on this on this script, and this works for all the built-in um, PyRevit scripts. Um, you can left click on the script in question and see the code for it. Uh, so that was the detail line coordinates, and alt click on it, and then it opens the file browser with that script, and so you could look directly in the screen. Uh, on, on in your text editor, see what the code is running. You can change it, save it, and click on the button again, and it runs this, the new code. So this is this is really nice for for very rapid prototyping. Great. I've got another question. If nobody else does, you were talking. Um, you were talking about the, 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 the that there's a few different ways of getting Rhino information into Revit, and luckily a lot of those uh, are open source projects, which makes them very interesting. Yeah, great example of somewhere where the big commercial players don't necessarily have the same interest as the users. Yeah, so I believe Rhino Inside is heavily supported by McNeil, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so there's a few different ways of getting data from Rhino to Revit, but you say that Rhino inside was was is quite clunky and requires quite a lot of work, does it? Not not necessarily clunky, but you have to basically recreate your object with um, Revit API. And um, since I've um, written uh, quite some Revit API, I also know there's a there's quite a few black holes. You know, like for example, you cannot create any ceiling object, so this is just not possible in Revit API, which is horrible. And then also you if you now. have if you, you can now in Revit 22. Oh in 22 they have it finally. Now you can, I mean, now you can get yeah, into the pictures, yeah. Finally. And then if you for example uh, create floors, you cannot have a uh, a you can have only one um, loop outline, but you cannot have a hole in the in the floor. The only way to get a scripted hole in your view you would need to do a an extra object that can cut in there. But this is not necessarily how you would model it so it, it is it is it has all the downsides um that revit api has that's that's all i meant yeah so that's why getting it getting it in via um ifc gives you a lot more control is that right e, well it saves me a lot of work no if, if the if the um I, I don't need to know how how i can uh create a ceiling or can create a hole with the mm -hmm. floor if it comes in correctly, uh, then then I just use the IFC um, 
the IFC that comes in uh, like that. Oh, I should probably um, quickly show also how it looks like if it doesn't work, because now you just saw the thing that worked, but uh, that was only working for me in the end. Um, when you have a, uh, I think I have a model where you can see the uh, IFC model, how it uh, is when it's not working. Um, and you would get not these typed floors and um, walls, but instead you would get the uh, model in place direct shapes. Uh, that should also, yeah. So now when I click, oh, wrong model. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let me quickly check if I find, thought I had that one. Uh, Uh, hard to tell. Yeah, basically, when th that was basically the case when we started. We had the um, uh, yeah, probably I only only find the ones that are working right now. But um, the the um, uh, the thing you would usually get with the IFC uh, import, uh, it would it would just um, create you these um, model. Um, in place direct shapes and um, usually you can't host uh, windows or floors on them and you can't stretch them like like other walls or trim like that and uh, yeah we, we really wanted to have this for the models that we wanted to yeah adjust in some ways oh and for that okay. and, if, and for that the only way to find out how that would work uh, um, was basically to create different versions of these because um, at some point um, uh, I got uh, I get plenty of IFC models here and um, some of them came from Archicad and um, uh, some of them not all of the Archicad walls but some of them were actually typed walls uh, that that came in uh, uh, from the IFC so I knew it was possible and I also find found some floors in the Archicad model that were IFC um, um, that came from ISC that were typed uh, floors in Revit. So I knew it was possible. And then I had a, a, a couple of um, chats uh, and uh, screen shares with Dian. And um, we found out what kind of yeah, mm, uh, recipe you need to actually uh, um, go and get a, a, typed, um, a typed wall or typed floor. I can actually quickly... Um, Show, show the recipe basically it's um it's actually once you know it it's not uh, it's not very uh not very special but um and these recipes i'll just say so if i've understood correctly recipes is just a, uh, what you call um scripts that tell blender bim what to do with an ifc file is that correct yeah so it's basically um the idea was we got um, the Rhino file in, then we had just these boxes, right? And then we need to classify them with, uh, with the right um, uh, IFC classes, which was simple because there was nice data coming from our, from our Rhino model. Uh, then setting up the levels that we need to find out because Rhino model didn't have any levels. And then we need to put the elements on the levels. And then in the end, here's the setup that is kind of the uh, quote unquote secret sauce, uh, how you can get typed um, uh, walls and floors. Um, and also, uh, yeah, not only floors, but also roof elements. These are both IFC uh, slabs. Um, for the walls, you need, oh, maybe I make it a little bigger. For the walls, you need a IFC material layer set. Um, and for the floors, you need an IFC material layer set usage, um, which I had not heard of before that uh, at all. Um, but basically when you have a wall, you would need um, some material and um, you would also need to have them as a, uh, as a rectangle extrusion if it was one or an arbitrary extrusion if you have, for example, a, yeah, and another kind of extrusion. And then in the um, IFC itself, it would um, of course first need a IFC material and then in the object data itself, it needs the IFC material layer set. So you have different um, possibilities, on, possibilities on what you can do uh, here as a 
you can have either a regular IFC material, a layer set, a layer set usage, and these were the two that we actually needed. Finally, you, do, you don't even need to specify it until the end. Usually we would go in here and say, okay, this is the name for my material layer set and I have good material and it also has a, a certain layer thickness. Maybe this is like 240. Um, but all of that stuff, Revit didn't care. Revit only wanted to know this here and then would actually even actively disregard what's, what's here, which is kind of strange. But, um, but yeah, once I knew that I need the um, material layer set for the walls and the material layer set usage for the floors, um, I could kind of prepare the, um, uh, the, the IFC export in a way that it would work fine in Revit. Okay, got any questions? I'm just going to quickly show. Um, so look here. Just going to quickly show. So there, there are lots of plugins and extensions to Blender. Um, so I just thought I'd show. If you go into our wiki and search for whatever, whatever it is you're looking for, you can go into Blender. Um, and then we have out to the out to the side here. There's all these different categories, and there is a whole category here for add-ins. So there's some of the add-ins. Uh, these are only add-ins that have got their own pages. So this one has got its own page. So I was thinking uh, for like maybe you can in in this text at the beginning here just add some of the ones that we haven't uh, that haven't gotten their their own pages yet. Uh, that could be quite good. Because otherwise, um, otherwise they can be a bit hard to find. Yeah. So anyone who knows of, uh, I mean, I, I just keep hearing of all sorts of great add-ins to Blender which are relevant to what we're doing. So if you know of one and it's not listed here, um, feel free to add it somewhere. I'll probably notice it and move it if it's in the wrong place or whatever. Or just let us know in the forum. Uh, so we can keep building the um, the list of, of good good add-ons that are relevant for Blender. Yeah, that's a good idea. I should uh, add the Rhino import um, plugin there as well. Yeah, because you can just go straight in and, and edit this first part of the page, which is just normal text. The rest of it is an automatic category system. But the first part, you can just uh, write in there. Yeah, that would be great. If we don't have any uh, questions, we might be finished for today. I'm going to guess that means that we don't. That's, that must be a sign of a, of a concise and clear explanation of uh, what you've been doing. Like, so everyone um, understands it. I would definitely like to talk to some of my colleagues about the, um, the aggregation of voids. There are all sorts of interesting things in there, which I know my colleagues have had a lot of have, have had a lot of struggles with and definitely could use that for doing some um, quality assurance for the MEP people. Yeah, it's definitely a struggle, a struggle uh, topic. Uh, in, uh, I hear that a lot of times, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I actually quite, in, quite, enjoy, quite enjoy it. I will drop a, a few of the repo links in the, in the chat also if anyone is interested to, um, to see them, but I will also later put the, post them like where the where the meetup was um, placed, so people can also look there for the links. Yep. yep. Okay. I'll say thank you very much, um, and that's that's it for this part of the meeting today. Well, thank you all.